and uh, now we're going to start this new session faced with new healthcare challenges. How can Europe take uh, example on the African e-health revolution? So we organize this uh, plenary with uh, the uh, ex-Marseille metropolis. The representative of the metropolis is going to be here really soon. She's stuck in uh, the traffic for the moment. But uh, we are here with many uh, actors who uh, work in the health field in Africa, actors who work on the ground. So there are many uh, uh, startups uh, that will be represented, so startups from uh, uh, different countries, and we will also uh, speak about examples of innovation with the Africa Europe Foundation. And we will also speak with uh, Israel Bimpe, he is the director for Africa Go to Market, of a startup called Zipline. So now, now we know that he health uh, accounts for. 15 million euros uh, sales uh, figures. So we are uh, going to speak uh, about uh, different uh, startups who work in e-health. There are many examples of successful startups, and they uh, produce high figures, high figures that we couldn't uh, find, uh, scarcely find a few years ago. But there are uh, there is a growing number of successful uh, startups in e-health. And it is a very agile uh, sector who can meet day-to-day -day challenges that can have a, a genuine impact on the ground and that puts a population at the center of its activities. There have been collaborations. They can emerge on both shores of the Mediterranean and they take example on African startups. For example, Zipline is a startup from Rwanda. It delivers blood in Rwanda. It has uh, delivered blood in Rwanda from 2016. At first, it was uh, hard to believe, but uh, now, today, the uh, local hospital is launching a similar project to deliver blood and medicines around Marseille, and this new project is directly inspired from the Zipline uh, adventure. So it uh, draws inspiration from Zipline in Rwanda. And today, for this session, there will be uh, different speakers with uh, Corinne Ouattara, the director of the Musso Health Pass, Please give a round of applause to uh, Corinne. We'll speak to Aniset Amani, the founder of ScanMed, and Youssef Travali. He is a research fellow for Research Europe and the founder of Africa Europe. Please uh, give a round of applause to Youssef. Israel Bimpe is uh, online, he is the director of Zipline. He will tell us about this new innovation, this blood delivery concept. So Israel is in Kigali. Please give a round of applause to Israel. And finally, Emmanuel Sharaf will join us in a few minutes. So let's start. The uh, Minister of Health of uh, Congo isn't available this afternoon, unfortunately. He has a presidential hearing and he couldn't join us. He, uh, we plan to have him online and he apologizes, but he won't be here tonight. The Vice President of the ex marseille Provence Metropolis has just arrived. She will soon uh, come to the stage along with us. And let's start uh, with uh, uh, Youssef. When uh, we face a healthcare crisis, there are challenges in the field of public policies. So let me remind you that this is a hybrid event there are a limited number of participants on site, but there are many people following us online. 
So many people are listening to us, which means that many people will uh, want to contact you on the platform later on. So we have uh, talked about knowledge transfer to uh, techniques to uh, control and use local knowledge. So how can we advance on this uh, front when we face a new variant? And here's the second question for you, yourself. So how, uh, why can we take advantage of digital technologies to advance health? What can we do on the ground? And what can e-health revolution uh, provide us? What can it provide us to uh, advance on the European continent? And uh, let us welcome Emmanuel Charab, the Vice President of the Ex-Marseille-Provence Metropolis. Thank you for being here. That's a complex question. I will start by uh, giving you information about the Africa Europe Foundation, Africa Europe Foundation. It is a network, a platform of a platform. It is a multi-stakeholder network with different, uh, different fields of actions. There is a group with uh, stakeholders, there is a women leaders group, and there is a strategic group. There are uh, five uh, strategic thinking groups on different fields, above all energy, transport, health. There's also a, a group on digital technologies, and I'm the head of the latter. So this foundation has three main objectives as of today. First of all, we, uh, we work on funding health in the, to produce vaccines in Africa. That's one of our main objectives. Secondly, we work in AI and emerging technologies in the field of health. So we try to take advantage of digitalization in the health sector. Our third main objective, last but not least, builds bridges between health and uh, climate challenges. Climate change will have an adverse impact on health, so we uh, work on this. So the pandemic has taught us that we need to focus on prevention. Prevention has to be one of our priorities. In the past, we have focused on uh, treatments, but if we want to take advantage of prevention, we must first and foremost level vaccine productions in Africa. So Africa must make as many vaccines as anywhere else. So we must m focus on vaccine production. So then we'll be able to really focus on prevention. Artificial intelligence and emerging technologies will play a crucial role on this, uh, on this, uh, in this field. So let's take, for example, chronic diseases. They cannot be uh, prevented, or they can be prevented. They can be linked to genetics or to uh, to climate. So we could use digitalization to uh, prevent these diseases and to reduce their impact on healthcare on healthcare systems in the long run. Furthermore, some of you might know how African healthcare system work, the, the pyramid-like systems, and there are challenges as for to access uh, information horizontally. So here, what we can do is we can use what's being done in Europe and you might know that in Europe there is a, a healthcare uh, European database and this database will help us collect a lot of data and we'll be able to use them for treatment but also for research. We could draw inspiration from such a system to create an African database shared between different countries and different healthcare actors. There's also another challenge with a building capacities, a capacity building. So we want to set up a human resources observatory in the field of health. 
we will need to uh, create a pool of uh, workers for health and for digital technologies, uh, people who can work in both fields. So that's really interesting uh, topics. You already mentioned a few interesting opportunities, but now let me welcome uh, Emmanuelle Charaf. She's the vice president of the Ex-Marseille Provence Metropolis that is one of the, is, uh, of the main partners of this event and every year we speak about e-health. Our territory has many assets for health management and more specifically for healthcare policies. These uh, concepts are uh, distinguished or recognized uh, overseas, especially in Africa. So can you tell us more about these healthcare policies and about these uh, partnerships with Africa? Good afternoon. And thank you for organizing this fifth edition of Emerging Valleys. Thank you for choosing us to organize, co-organize this event. I would like to thank all the participants, those who are here and those who are online. And uh, we uh, have to uh, organize, uh, we had to organize this uh, conference partly online because of the pandemic, but it shows that we can still collect, have a, a, an important, crucial input uh, from far away. But anyway, we don't have any choice. You mentioned uh, partnerships who depend on the characteristics of different sites and different partnerships. Here we have a very important healthcare ecosystem that we can uh, share. Our healthcare ecosystem is vibrant. It is rich and uh, the, it brings together uh, integrated uh, stakeholders, uh, stakeholders, local stakeholders. This healthcare ecosystem brings together public hospitals, research institutes that uh, are uh, that play a crucial role. It is also uh, very uh, going very well for biotech. Obviously, we faced this uh, health crisis and uh, Marseille is not Paris. That's why the metropolis has uh, strived to, uh, to diversify its activities and to expand on the territory. But we have a good equipment. We've got uh, 14 underwater cables coming together here. And we are trying to uh, put forward a, a great offer so that we can become a hub that will build bridges between Europe and Africa. We are in the middle. And we have a fit a digital equipment to uh, go ahead. African countries are have always been our partners in the healthcare se in the healthcare sector, and sixty percent of international collaborations are uh, with Africa here. The IHU opened a laboratory in Dakar to a study infectious diseases in developing countries. Let's talk about the IRD. So there are many uh, research programs here and the I IRD director was here last year with us and we are uh, committed to uh, working with Africa. So the IRD headquarters uh, are in Marseille. So we've always been working with Africa. That's the reason why I think we can uh, learn from each other, learn from each other's challenges. We have many assets, but Africa also has a lot of assets uh, uh, to uh, show us they have, Africa has been really creative. Over the past years, uh, various initiatives have come to life. A lot of, uh, um, um, of funds have been raised. 
let's mention African accelerators like uh, the, in Tunisia, for example. There is in Tunisia a business accelerator who has, uh, which is our partner. We will uh, help them with Biomed. So we are creating an interface. Furthermore, Africa has always been creative with many startups being created in Africa. For example, there is a, a startup which uh, distributes uh, medicines in Rwanda. It's called Zipline, and it has been an example. And Israel will actually take the floor in a few seconds. So I was saying that the Provence private hospital will try to solve uh, uh, issues of access to blood transfusion with drones. So we face similar challenges in different contexts. So we have a lot to learn from each other. You're right. So please give a round of applause to her to uh, Emmanuel Sharaf for you. This is a great example of how a great, a great innovation in Rwanda that is delivering blood in Rwanda called Zipline has inspired our territory. And the uh, Provence private hospital is going to emulate uh, the Zipline concept. So we uh, don't uh, operate in the same context, but it is the, uh, an, an inspiration. And now over to Israel, being paid director of Africa, go to market of Zipline. Do you speak French? I do speak French, but uh, for now I'll kind of speak in English and hopefully uh, you will get to have the translation. I'm uh, also very aware that there might be a delay, so my, my voice is probably getting to you a bit later than my video is getting to you. Um, no problem. First of all, I would like to thank you very much for the invitation and, and for really uh, having me here. It's such a great pleasure for, for me to be present and I congratulate you on pulling off an amazing event. I did follow through some session earlier in the morning. Thank you um, very much. As I said, I think Zipline is, a, is, is one of the pride of the continent and I've been with Zipline for four years and I'm one of the Rwandans who joined Zipline for the first time to really try and establish it in Rwanda and now I'm in charge of scaling it across the continent which is a testament of really the capability that we are able to deliver. As, a, as an innovation we are at the, the, the heart of two highly regulated industries which is aviation and healthcare and one of the things that's been amazing for us is seeing countries like Rwanda, countries like Ghana embracing this at a faster pace and at a very unprecedented pace than, than many other developed countries. So when we started in Rwanda, uh, we, we only started with blood, but it only took us one year for us to scale countrywide. So we are the primary supplier of blood outside the capital. We deliver more than 80% of national white blood products. But we are not only that, you know, even if we started with blood, we proved the concept. The government really was willing to expand and say, what else can we do? And, and really, how can we transform supply chain or healthcare system around such a system? And, and governments in Ghana and many other governments in Africa are following suit. And, and during the pandemic, I think when everyone was locked down, the whole world realized like what's going on in Rwanda and Ghana is what should be happening everywhere. And so authorities in the U.S. Um, allowed Zipline to start operating in May 2020 uh, in North Carolina. And so we are now establishing new partnerships in, in that sense. And, and I think since the pandemic, people are not only looking at that access and that emergency access aspect, they are really looking at supply chain and how can they be transformed with such a technology. And, and now they're even moving further and like how can we deliver directly to people's homes? Uh, for example, here in Rwanda, we are delivering to people's homes cancer medical products in combination with telemedicine's uh, approach to treat cancer patients who are on long-term medication instead of having them travel eight hours across the country. In, in Ghana, we are responding to the COVID pandemic and we've delivered more than 300,000 doses since April. And, and really ensuring that whenever the, the, the vaccines arrive in the country, 
there is an equitability aspect to how they are distributed across the country and no one is left behind, regardless of where they are based and where they are geographically. And uh, this, all of this is done by Africans. You know, as, as I said, I'm an example of this, but whenever the plant goes in a new country, we localize it 100%. Each of our hubs has up to 50 local young talents in those communities who are not only ensuring that our product is used to solve problems in those communities, but are also driving community acceptance. Before zipline, drones were only known for something very, very different, and we really have to get community buy-in from the get-go. And so it's, it's such a pride for us to see that we are able to drive this, and it says a lot about how much the world can still learn from the African continent, and the fact that we are not only transforming one industry, which is delivering healthcare using you know, technology and the fourth industrial revolution in that aspect, but we're also transforming how people think about upper mobility and aviation mm -hmm. and, and everything related to that. So it's, um, it's such a pride for us to be doing that, and, and I'm very grateful to be sharing this with you. Um, and, and happy Thank to you. continue conversing and ask some specific question in that sense. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Israel. Israel, what is the reaction when you hear that uh, here in Marseille, and uh, this is uh, Vice President Shara said that uh, uh, Marseille will try to implement the technology of the plane to deliver uh, blood and medicines uh, with the Hôpital Privé de Provence. What is your reaction? W would you expect that a few years ago? No, not at all. I would say even, you know, at the beginning of this year, that's not something you would expect. So it's, it's really exciting. And I think leaders like yourself um, is, is really what we look for in, in, in being able to carry this vision and drive it forward. And uh, this, this is something very exciting uh, for us to be able to work on. And, and hopefully we can think of a partnership and ways that we can contribute to that work. Uh, because we know that it's, it's going to take a lot to move around uh, from a healthcare perspective, from an aviation regulatory perspective, from a community buy-in perspective, and, uh, and, and we, we'd be very excited to be working with you and, and drive forward this vision, really ensure equitable access to all blood products and any other medical products, but also ensure a steady transformation using digital tools uh, of the future uh, to be able to provide the differentiated experience to citizens and, and patients and consumers uh, in, many different, uh, in many different ways. Thank you very much. Thank you, Israel. On peut applaudir Israel depuis, uh, depuis Kigali, Rwanda pour son... Please give a round of applause to Israel for uh, this uh, account. And now let's uh, talk about a, a concrete example from the ground. So we'll hear the uh, point of view of uh, startups. And here is Corinne Ouattara from Abidjan. She is the founder of uh, Pas Santé Musso uh, project, and uh, I saw the uh, it when it was born, uh, and uh, I was out in the field in Abidjan at the time. So, so of course, uh, you as a uh, Côte d'Ivoire uh, woman, and you aid women there. And can you tell us about uh, your uh, Pas Santé Musso and how uh, uh, all of these uh, elements of uh, African health can be transposed. Corinne, uh, the floor is yours. Yes. Uh, hello. Thank you also, Samir, for the opportunity that you give me uh, to talk about this. The uh, uh, This platform, Pas Santé Musso, is a support and device, and it's on the web, and it could be a brass a bracelet or a medal. I wear it. I am wearing my m medical dossier, my whole file on me because, uh, you know, just in case of emergency, because uh, a crisis situation can't wait. And so there's several functions here. You've got the little uh, uh, notebook, uh, the digitalizing uh, the uh, uh, pathway of the patient, for example. And of course, you can uh, take uh, the mother and child from prenatal to postnatal stages is uh, uh, taken on and uh, followed and treatment uh, uh, detection everything it's a full patient file uh, 
very complete, and not just for women, everyone, uh, contrary to what one might think. Uh, of course, the child, and of course, this is a problem that could be uh, part of the National Development Plan. And, or you could be uh, asthmatic, like I am, and you can have chronic, uh, uh, you could be affected um, in a chronic, chronically. But I think about 10 uh, percent of uh, admissions to the emergency uh, ward are due to medical errors, actually. And so uh, this pass will help us uh, reduce all of this. And right in the heart of the pandemic, for example, we can see uh, you know how where we're at and of course yes and of course yes you did you were there when the past was born at the time uh, you know it, it at the time it was a bit futuristic uh, we were saying uh, how could that actually happen is it really going to take place and will it really emerge and but then we realized we really had to go digital uh, how can you you know have um, a medical uh, visit uh, you know and how can you be followed up uh, because everyone was even afraid to go there to go to these health centers uh, or um, dispensaries and so today, your uh, passante Mousseau, uh, you were able to convince the health minister, and I think you're the one that actually does the support. You support them well, yes. Uh, we really have gone a long way and as of 2019 we were able to have an agreement signed with the health minister it wasn't easy because new technology marriage you know uh, isn't necessarily one that lasts but at least we can save lives this way so I can't really say that I support them but I do participate in the public health um, agreement and convention that was signed so but it's also my um, uh, overarching ministry and uh, of course it's uh, of course and innovation as well yes yeah, so well done Corinne congratulations and this has enabled us to have licenses because you know we're we've got very delicate and sensitive data included in these and so the regulators must be able to check and uh, see what we're working on so this double authorization you know, with the innovation and uh, uh, the pass of course we enables us to move forward rather quickly and we just signed an agreement uh, for a national deployment of these because we have 200 we signed this with the post offices we have 200 post offices and so they will be able to distribute these there's telemedicine as well but you can't do it without this pass because we do not we don't um, take over uh, for the telemedicine uh, sector but this comes to as a contribution to it and so these are all sorts of different things that we can do with this health pass there are more than uh, 22 uh, members on the platform and these are people that can be any kind of public health program um, breast cancer prostate cancer prostate uh, cancer radiotherapy uh, chemo and so there's a network of professionals uh, and not everyone can just come to Abidjan and you uh, can't always afford the cost of uh, some of the treatment and so you can some of it can be done from home and so of course with all of the data we partner with ScanMed as well and all the startups and that's one of the great advantages of this health pass the Musso health pass we're all working uh, synergetically together and uh, it's part of African reality now thank you very much nice warm round of applause for Corinne and now I will ask Annie Set who is the founder of a, an e-health uh, uh, project in I the Ivory Coast and so 
So you work uh, uh, in saving lives. Uh, it's very, you know, people that are very fragile and very poor health. And so Annie said you help these people. And how does this, how do you use this on a daily basis to facilitate uh, medical uh, departments and wards? and the medical sector. Well, we're a telemedicine uh, sector, uh, medical visits online, and it helps the uh, inhabitants, especially populations in the heart of the country in Ivory Coast to have access to um, general practitioners. And here we have a few figures that uh, justify the development of this platform in the Ivory Coast. Uh, most, uh, as most African countries, they have a health uh, system in the form of a pyramid. Uh, first or initial contact health centers, they're called. This is an initial contact with the health centers, but uh, uh, a very serious figure is 90% um, of uh, the medical visits in the uh, health center in the Ivory Coast are done by nurses, actually, and the in these uh, initial medical contact centers. And they most of them don't have an access to a general practitioner at all. And so on our platform, this population can easily access a general practitioner or a specialist uh, doctor. And how do we do it? We are in an African country, and so uh, people aren't always at ease with the uh, IT tools and so we have you know in these health centers uh, these initial contact uh, dispensaries if you wish um, uh, they use uh, computers and when the patient comes to the health center they can contact from based on this platform they can contact um, a remote doctor somewhere um, and in Abidjan, uh, we have uh, uh, one doctor that works on the biggest cardiological center in Fre Fre in Western Africa. And so we can help people in the area of cardiology uh, six or seven or 800 kilometers away from Abidjan. And so um, we can help them and uh, um, bring uh, health uh, elements to the entire population. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, would like to applaud you warmly for this. So we've seen these two startups, Annie Sit and uh, Corinne, they can change things. And so uh, now... Uh, but if you are still hearing us, we know that uh, eHealth requires, requires many precautions about data security, including uh, collecting storage, anonymization. According to you, what is the current situation in Africa about this, uh, this issue? And uh, how can we generalize good practices in uh, uh, eHealth uh, about uh, the question of the, the data uh, and the security of the data uh, protection? Yeah, I do think there are two dimensions to, to this. There is on one side, the startups that are building in the space in terms of setting really high standards of uh, how they manipulate and manage data of the users of their platforms. But I think on the other side, we also have to have policy response and activity around a framework within which it's working. And I would say, uh, you know, on the startup side, I think there is a maturity that has been going on over the last few years in terms of uh, really building scalable uh, data frameworks that are really protecting the, uh, a patient's data, but also allow the right level of interoperability and the right level of research and other things that we can do when data is open and shared across the board. Um, and so I, I do see companies really maturing in so many ways using the latest tools 
and then you can see moves by big players like um, uh, Amazon Web Services and Microsoft and, and others in the continent and playing a bigger role in that as well. Um, and, and on the policy side, I think um, Youssef is much more plugged into that work, but we are seeing so many governments uh, really adopting uh, some of the latest regulation, uh, most of the time inspiring themselves from the GDPR aspects of what has been happening uh, with the European Union. Uh, for example, Rwanda just adopted one of those in, in the last six months, and many other countries are following suit. Um, and, and with things like AFCFTA, that is allowing some sort of harmonization across the continent, probably we will have um, a, a common policy and political framework under which uh, that, that people can work on, which I think will create a bigger advantage as many of these startups have to scale beyond their countries. And uh, one of the biggest challenges that many of them face is the different regulatory frameworks that they have to abide by, which makes it so hard to build in this space and scale continent-wide. Um, so I think that those two dimensions, I think there is a certain level of maturity that has been happening in the last year or so, um, and it's something to, to be celebrated, but uh, I think uh, we have to call for more of that to be happening. And startups like ours do try and take um, a step forward to set, to set really the standard where you are. Like Zipline, we, we, set, we, we put ourselves on really the highest possible standards. For example, we follow the US FDA HIPAA regulation in terms of who has access to the data and who can manipulate it and, and how we store and manage it in the company. We localize all the data in the country where we are operating. And those kind of practices internally are really things that we should build into the culture of companies and how we operate and behave. It's, it's some ways to build uh, trust with the users as well as the partners. Um, and, and then often than not, we will lead in front of policy uh, frameworks, but they, they do tend to follow quite quickly and it's, uh, it's something exciting. I think it speaks, uh, when you look at it from a big picture, it speaks so much to the maturity and the maturing aspects of um, policymakers on the continent on, on issues of digitization and digital health more broadly and the realization that it's a, it's a no-brainer, it's happening and we just have to accompany it in some ways. Um, so that, that's, that's, that's what I'll share on that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Israel. Merci pour, thank you for your, for your message. I go back to you. Um, je reviens vers toi, uh, Youssef. Youssef, uh, how today with respect to what Israel has just said uh, regarding policy making and public uh, with respect to Africa and uh, in the realm of health and e-health. How can you uh, make advances in terms of cooperation and concrete cooperation um, and what structures can we set up? For example, this type of very concrete example uh, between uh, the metropolis uh, and the private uh, hospital of um, Marseille and the African ones and what Corinne and Annie said have uh, presented, uh, can, how can this be a, a, a great lever to render all of this operational? rather than just uh, staying at the uh, magnificent political declarations level. Yes, effecti indeed, uh, we have, the, uh, there are some cases like this in Africa that we can talk of. Uh, this is the model that we try to uh, labelize the uh, circular innovation model uh, on two continents. Very uh, relevant model. We've never really talked about it as such. And what we see is through such a circular model, we see knowledge circulate, skills circulate, technology circulate circulate and uh, financial instruments circulate as well and so we can just plug in no anywhere uh, in the circle and draw all of the advantages that can come out of this on stage two I saw this morning uh, someone who said that in France we have the best researchers, extremely high performance, uh, but we have to be able to enhance it and um, add value uh, to it. Of course, uh, there's very low investment rates uh, in research. 
Uh, it's one of the lowest peaks on a graph. And, but we must uh, plug into this for innovation purposes. And from the innovation, go to Africa, Europe, uh, Europe Africa, and uh, uh, the United States and other places. So we have to have this uh, cooperation model, which I think will be a very well-balanced one between Europe and Africa. And secondly, uh, we should be able to uh, set up um, uh, the executives that can, or uh, focuses actually, one uh, ethics, work ethics, uh, uh, in the digital world, we don't uh, look very closely at ethics. And so secondly, uh, data, uh, we're going to have to work on interoperability, the laws governing this and sharing uh, data. Thirdly, anything that uh, touches These are very important and it's in the area of health and it's not very well developed and we have a tendency to limit it to one or two levels. But what African countries do this very little, even Ghana that we talk a lot about doesn't have it. And so now in a lot of chronic diseases, a lot of countries do it, but uh, actually a huge percentages of people die of chronic diseases or uh, accidents. But we have to look at all of this and uh, look at it in, you know, at lower level levels rather than the higher architectural levels. Thank you very much for this vision of a policy making and cooperation. And this is the work that you do on the Africa Europe uh, um, Association. And so now, Madam Chair, uh, of course, there's a lot going out, going on out in the field and a lot of dynamics. Uh, uh, moving and you have quoted a very good example of, of incubators that are starting to work together and uh, do you know soft loading and uh, soft lending. How can you uh, enhance uh, uh, this and how can you have Ex Marseille Provence be uh, more oriented towards more startups, innovators, as Corinne and Anisat have uh, demonstrated. And as Yousef has very well said, you know, partnering and test solutions and then uh, go to the next scale. Well, I am very impressed by everything I've heard today. And it's a fabulous dynamics working out there. We learn a lot one from the other. And indeed, <clears throat> e-health is an area that's extremely important uh, and big in our territories. But we can really um, draw from these African experiences and uh, <clears throat> be enriched. There are examples, for example, Zipline, uh, which is really interesting. And classically, we had the notion that research, especially academic research, uh, is more developed in France, very well structured over <laughs> several uh, years, um, medical research, scientific research. But, you know, in the terms of health, there's a lot to learn uh, and lots to do. And uh, this um, it's a win-win situation, co-construction, co-experimenting, co-building. And so these are things that we could be setting up together. And we've got a lot to learn from what's happening in e-health in Africa. And uh, broadly speaking, uh, this is uh, uh, an area that where we can um, take a, a advantage of uh, medical expertise, but actually the aim of all researchers that, and doctors and whom 
I represent here because that's um, what I am actually uh, but we want to work so that the most the greatest numbers uh, take advantage of it and so eHealth enables us to do this and to get this expertise and access the expertise I'm very impressed by the medical a new digital uh, medical file the pass health the muso health pass for example and you know in the emergency uh, wards in Marseille we don't have that kind of thing and uh, we would be it would be good to be inspired by this uh, and the geography and the medical demography as well it's different in Africa and than here because I think that the figures are very low and uh, I think we can say that uh, there's less than 0 0.25 it's 0 0.23 uh, medical doctors in sub-saharan Africa and so we can manage problems only you know that if uh, health uh, can if we can do so in the area of health in Europe we have good level uh, you know medical doctors but there are so also areas that we call medical deserts where there are no doctors left and so I think we can improve in this area thank you madam chair thank you for your words I think that all local health innovators are now invited to come and test their solutions on the ground so we still have five minutes left do you know that there will soon be the Europe Africa summit and I am sure that uh, health should be tackled during this summit uh, under the French presidency as you know emerging valley is under the patronage of the French presidency so we will issue a white paper that will be published in February so I'll give you uh, one minute each what are your recommendations to accelerate cooperation between Africa and Europe in the health sector healthcare sector and what can uh, we uh, recommend to the uh, next Europe Africa summit so uh, as a recommendation I would encourage uh, a collaborations I would uh, promote a, the implementation of very efficient healthcare system we have solutions that work there but that could work here too so we have here the opportunity to get in contact or to match uh, structures and entities that work here so we could work together thank you Corinne Anisat over to you what will be your recommendations for the next Europe Africa summit as Corinne said, I would recommend collaboration in the field of health. There are really good uh, figures in Africa. As for the number of uh, doctors per inhabitant, uh, according to the population, so now what we can do to help uh, locals is, uh, for example, you can have anyone in Abidjan who can get in contact, who talk to a doctor from Marseille over uh, the internet, so we could avoid uh, journeys and traveling, so we could start new collaborations with avoid avoiding and avoid uh, travels I think that I do think the medical co cooperation is crucial so we mentioned partnerships and collaboration I do think that the metropolis could play a crucial role well there are synergies between the territory and your solutions this uh, metropolis could be uh, could host uh, tests and innovations Youssef over to you so as a conclusion I have two suggestions well I only mentioned one I think we should set up an observatory for uh, skills in the field of health or e-health this uh, sector is a, a evolving and soon we'll need skills in every level uh, that is in uh, the medical field as well as in other sectors of the uh, Africa Europe uh, summit uh, what would you be your recommendation in terms of uh, cooperation in the e-health uh, sector? 
I think I would come back to what you said, spoke about earlier, which is circularity of uh, Europe and Africa in collaboration, which many others pointed to. I think it's important that we build pillars of what that that build that circularity will build on in terms of exchange of talent, exchange of capital, exchange of information, and and you know really talent observation and making sure that there is some sort of circularity and partnership uh, across the continent that creates some sort of uh, one foundation or one infrastructure that is common on which both continents and innovators and governments build on uh, to develop their, their respective e-health industries that, that I really believe will end up being one and, and standardized across the world. So uh, that's really my recommendation for us to see those clear pillars of what that circularity will be in reality uh, established. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Israel. Et enfin, uh, Madame. And finally, over to uh, Emmanuel Sharaf. What would be uh, Marseille's message? What can we do to accelerate the cooperation between Europe and Africa, ahead of the uh, Africa Europe uh, Summit? To sum up everything that's been said so far, I do not have any very uh, original uh, recommendation. We've uh, mentioned collaboration, a medical collaboration with a remote expertise. I heard about uh, an e-health observatory was also mentioned. This is a really interesting suggestion. I think we should co-build together, no matter where the skills are. We can do it online. Data and user data should travel in a safe way, obviously. Uh, this will be one of our main challenges. So we should make data travel, not people. So that's what we should focus on. We should also uh, focus on co-building skills and building on everyone's assets. Thank you very much. Please give a round of applause to Emmanuel Sharaf, the Vice uh, President of the Ex-Marseille-Provence Metropolis, then Corinne Ouattara, the founder of the Musso Health Pass. Israel Bimpe was here with us too from Kingley in Rwanda. Thank you, Israel. Anisat Amani, and finally, Youssef Travali, a research fellow at the Africa Europe Foundation. Thank you, everyone. We will now take a photo before the next session. Thank you.